Hey everybody, uh, we did a short video here a few weeks ago on some behind the scenes uh, stuff at the Riverbend Dutchman where we're fixing some equipment and just kind of a sneak peek at some of those things and had a, a good response from that video and had a lot of people reach out via email and messenger um, asking to do a little bit of a, a deeper dive into how we do um, some of the sound production for the concertina and what's involved with miking and some of the different strategies and basically uh, Chris what do you guys do? Um, so I thought we'd do just another quick video and, and talk a little bit about uh, that. Um, first off let me start out by saying there's a million different approaches to how you might do that. So there's probably no one way, there's no perfect way. I think it's all very much dependent on each person's um, situation, their setup, uh, where you're playing, how you're playing, um, what other instrumentation is in the band. So there's so many variables. There's no perfect way of doing it. Um, but in particular, you know, the concertina is a really unique instrument. Um, it lives sound-wise on, on the sound spectrum um, around 160 hertz up to about 4K. And kind of all the sound frequencies kind of live in that general area. The thing is with the concertina, um, and probably this would extend to the accordion also, is that it radiates different tones in all different directions. So each surface of the concertina has a distinct timber um, and tonal quality to it. So it's a difficult instrument to, to mic and get a real natural sound. On the melody side of the concertina, the soundboard over here, has a very different sound coming out than on the bass side, on the on the soundboard on this side. Same thing with the, the front of the concertina. The front surfaces and the bellows um, radiate a completely different sound than other parts of the instrument. Plus there's the, the air hole here where the air is coming in and out. Um, the buttons, you know, make noise which may or not be desirable. So there's a lot of different mic placement techniques that can have a really dramatic effect on the tonal balance of the concertina. Um, dynamic mics, as an example, might pick up less air noise and less button noise than a condenser mic. So there's different mics, there's different techniques, different placements, and it all can have a huge, huge impact. So when we talk about miking the concertina, again, lots of different types of microphones. Um, a very common microphone um, to use is a dynamic microphone. Um, one example of that, um, kind of an industry standard, but it's a, a microphone called the SM57, manufactured by Shure. Um, it's relatively inexpensive, and it does a great job of capturing um, the frequency range that the concertina kind of lives in. So dynamic microphones take um, electromagnetic induction. They basically take the sound waves um, and convert it to an electric signal. And how that works is there's a little mylar diaphragm inside of there that's attached to a coil. And when the sound waves hit that diaphragm, um, it, it vibrates and sends a signal through that coil, um, which transfers it to an electric signal. And that's how a dynamic microphone transfer sound waves into something um, that you can amplify or record. So dynamic mics are not a, are not a bad choice. Work pretty good. Um, another type of microphone that's out there that can be used, although probably more so in the studio situation versus a live performance, is a ribbon microphone. So these are examples um, of ribbon microphones. These are uh, Royer R10 ribbon microphones. Um, ribbon microphones work. There's a, a very thin aluminum strip um, inside the ribbon microphone with a magnet attached to each end of it. And uh, when the sound waves hit that, the difference in, in the movement in that aluminum strip causes an electrical um, magnetic change between the magnets and it takes the sound waves and converts them to an electrical charge. It's probably the most natural sounding reproduction 
Typically not as bright as, say, a condenser microphone or a dynamic micro microphone. And it produces a very um, clear and natural sound. Primarily, again, used in the recording studio. The reason for that is they're very delicate compared to other types of microphone. Them thin aluminum strips are very delicate. They can break very easily. So you have to be very careful in handling them. And, and so that's why they really probably make a better um, recording studio microphone. You won't see a ribbon microphone used too often in the field. A third type of microphone that could be used um, are condenser microphones. They work by taking um, a, a movable metal diaphragm that's basically attached to a fixed metal plate. And as that movable metal diaphragm moves, uh, both of those, the diaphragm and the plate, are electrical, electrically charged. And the distance between the two changes, which results in very small, minute voltage changes um, between the two that mimic the original sound waves. So they offer probably the best high frequency um, reproduction of audio um, compared to um, different types of microphones. Um, and so they're really good at picking up kind of subtle nuances. That's why a lot of times they're used in the music studio for vocal recording. Now there's different types of condenser microphones. Um, there's large diameter condenser microphones. Um, so I just grabbed a few of these microphones here off the, off the shelf. We're at Barefoot Studios today. Um, but this is a Neumann TLM-103. Uh, it's kind of the a middle of the road, um, if you will, a large diaphragm condenser microphone. Um, large diaphragm is really kind of basically defined as any diaphragm that's bigger than one inch diameter. Um, is called a large diameter microphone. Um, but those really work best for voice. They, they do a really good job of capturing um, a really well-rounded uh, spectrum on the frequency of frequency response. Um, and they come in different polar patterns. Um, the one hanging above my head here, we used to capture some sounds from the grand piano. It's a U47. And, um, it's got different polar patterns that can be um, set, and so it's it's very versatile. Again, you won't find too many of these out in the field um, because they're somewhat delicate and you have to be careful with handling them. Um, another option for condenser microphones are small diaphragm condenser microphones, basically defined as any diaphragm less than an inch in diameter. Really good for high frequency sources um, and recording instruments. Um, with all condenser microphones, they all require an external power supply. Um, so it's kind of a, an extra thing that you have to do. You can't just plug it in and go. It needs to have a, a power supply to, to power it specifically. Um, so this microphone right here is what we've been using at the Riverbend Dutchman. And it is a small uh, diaphragm condenser microphone. Um, it has an external power supply. Um, that powers it, and it's uh, made by a company called Peluso Microphones. Now, uh, John Peluso um, founded uh, his company, Peluso Microphones, in 2002, and he's an expert microphone craftsman. Um, has a lot of experience in repairing uh, vintage microphones that kind of led him to starting his own company, and they're based out of Willis, Virginia. It's a family-run company. Um, everything, all the parts are of the highest quality uh, made in the United States, and they currently offer something like, I want to say, 18 different models of microphones. So this is the CEMC6, again, small diaphragm condenser microphone. Um, it's got a 20 millimeter uh, gold diaphragm. It has a very high SPL rating, which means um, it can really handle um, loud, uh, large, sources of sound without causing any sort of distortion. And its frequency response is very flat across the frequency spectrum. So it's not boosting any particular frequencies or um, attenuating any frequencies. Um, it, it really captures a very um, natural sound. Uh, the transformer inside of the microphone is hand wound uh, by hand and the amplifier stage inside the microphone is solid state. So it's very durable um, for for road use, which is desirable for a band that's on the road. Um, 
again, if, if you're someone that just uh, plays at home maybe or occasionally a few times a year, this probably is more microphone than what you need. Um, again, it all depends on your use and that's okay. Um, if you um, frequently play and you know, you've got a, a band where there's other instruments and you need to really um, amplify the concertina you know, to, to be able to balance the sound of the band, then maybe this is right for you. As far as condenser microphones go, this one's really kind of, I would say, middle of the road. Um, not so much in quality, but in price. Um, it retails for about uh, a little under $500, um, which for the quality of the microphone you're getting is a, a really, really good price. So a lot of different options. Um, I typically mic my concertina um, on the melody side. That's really what I'm trying to capture. So this is generally kind of the setup is I'll have about a foot from the concertina um, my microphone set up to kind of pick up the sound off the melody side soundboard. I'm not as concerned with the bass side because um, again I'm playing with the large eight piece band um, and we've got you know the tuba is playing the bass notes and oftentimes the tenor saxophones are playing down in the lower register or the piano um, is adding some rhythm in the lower register and so I don't need to focus so much on amplifying the bass side because there's a lot of other instruments that are pay playing some of those lower frequencies and a lot of times um, when you're trying to balance the sound of a band um, and, and the mix of a band of what the audience is hearing, a lot of times less is more. Um, so that's kind of been my approach. Um, some concertina players have little dynamic microphones, they call them uh, like pancake microphones that are suspended inside the concertina in the bellows and then there's a, a jack on the concertina that you would plug that into. Um, I used to have one of those. I took it out for several reasons. One, when you play a four-hour dance job and the concertina is hanging off your neck, anything you can do to reduce weight is a good thing because your back oftentimes hurts after a band job. Um, the other thing is those microphones, not always, but a lot of times tend to be really um, lower quality microphones and so it, it's, you know, you're taking what can be a, a $15,000 instrument and putting a $60 microphone inside of it. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, again, that might work well for somebody that's trying to capture that sort of sound. It wasn't for me, so I removed it. The other thing, the main reason that I took mine out, because when I ordered this concertina, I, I specified it to have one um, put in there. But the main reason I took mine out is because it's inside. If you're playing close in, it sounds one way, and if the bellows are extended way out, it sounds completely different, and the tonal quality of the sound changes dramatically depending on pulling or pro, you know, if you're pulling or you know, air in or out, and if the bellows are extended out or if they're they're put in, dramatic change in the tonal quality. Um, and in, to me, it didn't sound natural, um, and so I preferred to mic one or both sides of the concertina to, to capture a more natural sound. But um, in a playing situation with the Riverbend Dutchman, again, big eight-piece band, uh, very loud on stage with, with a lot of acoustic instruments. Um, again, I'm not as focused on amplifying the bass side of the instrument because uh, a number of the other instruments are kind of playing in, in that frequency range and, and hitting the bass notes. I don't have to. Uh, so that's been my approach. So, as I mentioned, uh, with these condenser microphones, um, it's not just the microphone, you have to have a, a power source. Um, and so I have um, here, I, I take this board with me and it has all of the extra add-on things that I would want um, at a band job. So including, um, I have a Studio V3 tube preamplifier. Um, it's made by a company called Applied Research and Technology. Um, it produces the external power for the condenser microphone. It provides it with 48 volts of electricity um, and um, brings up the volume 
and the, the gain of that microphone to make it more of a line level type source. Um, the tube itself, the, the, the tube part of the amplifier, really provides a slight warming of the tone, um, which comes off sounding very pleasant and natural sounding. Um, the tube amplifier is relatively inexpensive. It's a good one for road use. You don't have to worry if you drop it and break it. Um, it's not going to be the end of the world. Um, you know, we have some tube preamplifiers here in the studio that are, you know, five, six, seven thousand dollars a piece. Um, you wouldn't want to take that on the road and risk, uh, you know, a drink getting spilled on it or something like that. So this is relatively inexpensive. Works good for the road. Um, from there, um, I feed the signal through um, a Fishman Tone DEQ or Tone Deck. Um, what that does is two things: is it takes and we can add in a little bit of low level or, or slow delay. I use about 60 milliseconds of delay. Um, the reason for that, it just um, adds a little bit of extra ambience that really sounds nice or pleasant. Um, again, that is a, a subjective thing. Everybody probably has different tastes, and so that's something that can be adjusted or, or taken out. Um, I also put just a small amount of uh, chorus uh, is kind of an effect in there, again, just to complement some of the frequencies of the concertina. And then finally, um, there is a slight amount of uh, equalization in there, so you can roll off some of maybe of the frequencies that um, are undesirable. What I mean by that is if you play on a certain stage or in a certain room, um, because of the size of the room or the shape of the stage, you might get some high frequency feedback or something that's just the nature of live sound and amplifying things. And so that EQ allows you to maybe roll off a little on the top end just to uh, prevent any of that sort of feedback and things like that. And then finally, in the chain, I have a uh, transformer isolator unit, which really kind of helps clean the electronic signal and prevents electronic interference. Um, anybody that's played in a band, you know, a lot of the old ballrooms or some of the, the bars or VFW clubs that you might find yourself playing in, you know, where the buildings are pretty old, the electrical system is old, and you might be playing next to the room where the freezer is, and when the compressor on the freezer turns on, you get some 60 cycle interference, and the next thing you know, you've got this buzz in your PA system that you don't want. Now the box itself where all this equipment is placed on is uh, not something that you can just go out and buy in the store. Um, it's such a specialized uh, market obviously with the concertina that you know you're not going to find this at Sweetwater. Um, so it's custom built by me out of solid walnut. Um, all of the the plugs uh, have a function. They're all uh, recess routered in. On the back there's a power outlet strip that's routered in which comes in handy for band jobs when you have different power needs. Um, so all made out of walnut. The top is this velcro-y material so you can just velcro your components directly to it. All the wiring is contained, uh, self-contained inside the unit. So you can basically um, show up at a job, plug your microphone in, put the power on, and you're, you're set and ready to go. No plugging in a bunch of plugs and things like that. It's already kind of self-contained all within the unit itself. So that's a lot of information. Um, we could get a lot more detail. That's really just kind of the 50,000 foot view level, but that's kind of the different options that are really available, the different microphone placements, the different types of microphones. Um, the different methods of you know microphone placement and how you might do it. Again, there's no right way, there's no wrong way. It all very much depends on what you're doing and um, your setup, where you're playing, how you're playing, the type of band you're playing in. Um, all of that, all of that plays into it. So no right way or no wrong way. But had a lot of questions about what do we do, and that's what I do. Um, might not be the method for everybody, but it's it's the one that works pretty good uh, for me. So when you put it all together with the condenser microphone, the tube amp, the delay, the EQ, you get a pretty nice sound out of the concertina through the PA system. <laughs>
everybody. That's the setup that we use at the Riverbend Dutchman. Condenser microphone, tube amp, uh, sounds good for the concertina. The mic placement works for us. The type of microphone works for us. Um, again, no right way, no wrong way. It all just depends on all kinds of different variables. But uh, we sure appreciate everybody who wrote in wanting to kind of know what our approach was after the last video that we did. And uh, we sure appreciate all the comments and the emails. Um, keep them coming. Thank you and I uh, hope you enjoyed today's video. Catch you next time.